Nobody's born and just falls into a centered life. You have to have a dream that's big enough that you don't need a crisis. Two, we have to know what balance is in our life. So positive is yang, negative is yin. Next, we all have three choices. The optimal, the suboptimal, or to do nothing. Dr. Happiness is the chief physician that's in charge of identifying what is happy making for you. Because if you don't do things that are happy making regularly enough, you forget how to be happy. So Dr. Movement really is in charge of saying, how much movement do I need? Okay, Dr. Diet means what's the quality of my food? and what do I need to eat to keep myself in balance. Dr. Quiet is the physician of rest, introspection, and regeneration. So what can I change versus what I can't? We also have to be aware of what is true versus untrue. Next, take time for self-reflection daily. I am going to put my reflection and my new choice of behavior into action and then we want to represent ourselves. So you represent yourself. Hello everybody, welcome back to my video blog. Today I thought I would talk about something that I think is very, very important, especially if you're a very busy person like myself that has multiple companies to run and be involved in, a lot to get done. For the last two years, practically day and night, I've been writing a new series of books, which you will learn about real soon. I'm getting close to finishing the series and uh, getting it into editing and layout. And so when you have that much to do and you're coaching people and you're a father and you're filming and you're working on your farm and doing all sorts of things, it's easy to kind of get stressed and try to figure out how to do it all. And of course, in the last three years, the world's been going through all sorts of you know, bubbling and boiling and confusion and chaos and propaganda and BS and a little truth here and there. So it can make it hard to find your center. And in my studies, I came across a beautiful quote by Houston Smith, who I absolutely love. He was considered the foremost expert on world religion, and he's a very, very deep, profound author. And Houston Smith says something profound with regard to leading a centered life. He said, insofar as one leads a centered life, tensions disappear. And that's a really true, beautiful statement, but it can often be very hard for us to hold our center if we don't have enough life experience and maturity and we don't have any techniques for knowing how to stay in our center and if we don't have something more important than the drama of life. My friend who's been on my podcast a couple of times, Keith Witt, a very well-known integral psychologist, says we, in most any situation in life, we have two choices. One, continue to create more drama. Two, create solutions. So if we're caught in the kind of drama of life, but we haven't reached a level of maturity where we realize solutions is the only way that we can return back to our center and be productive and contribute to whatever the issue is, then uh, it's easy to get caught. And eventually a person can start just living out of their center. And that leads to all sorts of anxiety, nervousness, challenges and relationships and a long string of problems that ultimately stress people out, lead to addictions, burnout, and uh, relationship uh, breakdowns. So today I'd like to talk about some of the techniques that I use and have been using for a long time to protect myself from distractions that ultimately eat away at my ability to be productive as a man, as a teacher, as a father, as a businessman, etc. This symbol right here is the symbol of the self, the circle, 
in this case represents the feminine or the womb. The dot represents the masculine. So this is another way to represent the yin and the yang, but the self is symbolized here. So for example, your body would be here, but the activity of your mind and the field of receptivity of the soul would fill the whole circle. And if this dot moves around, then you're getting off center. So when somebody's in their center, that's when they're in their heart and the heart sits between the upper three chakras, the fifth, communication, creativity, the sixth, sixth, insight, and seeing through, clairvoyant, seventh, intuition, and beliefs about God and fears about death, third, who am I, the self, second, life force energy, sexual energy, and or libido, and the root, safety and security. So the heart sits right between them and it's the heart that's the only part of us that can give the head the truth or help the head make honest judgments without all the drama added to it. The head alone is like a drama generator but when the heart gets involved we can always ask ourselves what would love do now and whenever we do what is genuinely loving for everybody involved we come back into our center. Some of the tips I can give you for staying in your center is one, you have to have a dream that's big enough that you don't need a crisis or you'll probably tend to live in crisis mode and not realize that you're habitually creating crisis or challenge uh, wherever you go potentially. So the first thing we need is what I call what is your one love or your dream that can also be your goal or objective at any day or week or month or year in your life and that anchors you so that you can decide what is or isn't relevant and worth getting involved in or sidetracked by. Two we have to know what balance is in our life so positive is yang negative is yin positive masculine negative feminine in the middle we have neutral. So if something's positive, even an argument, because it's a necessary process in order to continue to create the dream or maintain the dream, then that's not a diversion from center, that's a normal process of digestion. You know, conflict in relationship is not unhealthy as long as the people involved A have a common mission, vision, and values, and B, can stay connected at the heart. When conflict causes a diminishment of the other or the objectification of the other is less than human or less than you, then you're dramatizing and you're creating more problems and you're not only not living in your center, but you might be completely getting out of yourself and end up going, why did I do that? Why did I say that? I can't believe I did that again, which means you're living out of your unconscious, which is why Jung says, if you don't meet your unconscious on the inside, it will meet you on the outside in the events of your life, and you will call it fate. So we want to make sure that we're not um, generating distractions and we can generate distractions by being involved in people that aren't important to our dream, that don't share a mission, vision, and values, and may not have any appreciation for the importance of you staying focused on what it is that you're doing in your life. So what is your dream, goal, or objective? And that dream, goal, or objective needs to be big enough that you're willing to grow to get it, and deal with challenges and convert them into opportunities in a positive way. Next, we all have three choices. The optimal, the suboptimal, or to do nothing. So whenever we're faced with a choice with relationship to ourself, relationship to other persons, places, or things, we have to consider these three choices. The optimal is always the best for everybody on your dream team. The suboptimal usually gives instant gratification but causes stress on your dream team. The third choice is to do nothing which has three applications. So if you've got to make an important decision such as a big expense like a new car, or a new house, or uh, 
potentially try to decide if you should or shouldn't get vaccinated or take a, a specific medical procedure. Um, anything that's weighted where, where there's consequences to the action, the first application of do nothing means if you are not sure because you've gathered all the necessary information to look at the pros and cons of a decision or opposing viewpoints, then do nothing until you've gathered enough information to make an intelligent decision and then make the optimal decision that's best for everybody involved based on what you've gathered. If other people are involved, then naturally share the information that you've gathered. If you share information with somebody that's important to your dream process that opposes their viewpoint, but they won't look at it, it usually means you have somebody that's caught in a belief system or a dogma, and that means to stay unconscious, and that is a dangerous person to have on your dream team, because if you're not willing to look at viewpoints that oppose your bias, it means that you're so heavily biased, you're not interested in the truth, you're just interested in being right or getting your own, your own way, which puts that person in the child archetype, and most of us can't achieve anything meaningful with a team full of children wearing adult bodies. So you have to be conscious of who you share your dream goals and objectives with. The next application of do nothing is if you are having an argument or a discussion with somebody like a spouse or a family member or somebody on your dream team and it's getting heated and you can't stay connected at the heart, the second application to do nothing is to call a timeout and say, I'm not able to stay connected to you at, at the heart right now. I'd like to take a time out and come back when we can both be more centered and be conscious that we're working for a resolution that's best for both of us and just walk away. If you do that and the person won't stop fighting and arguing, then you already know that that's not the kind of person you probably want to be in a relationship with because, again, you have a child on your hands, not an adult and that means you're a babysitter, you don't have a partner. The third and the most dangerous application of do nothing is to be apathetic, which simply means not to care. And if you're acting apathetically with regard to issues of your life that are important and accomplishing your dream goals and objective, then it means that you don't have a well-selected or a well-qualified dream goals or objective, and that you're probably putting a lot of time, energy, and effort into something that isn't very important, which means you're already out of your center. Next, we have to have four doctor core values. I developed the system many years ago. If you've watched any of my videos, you've probably come across it. Dr. Happiness is the chief physician that's in charge of identifying what is happy making for you because if you don't do things that are happy making regularly enough, you forget how to be happy and you start expecting other people to make you happy, which causes codependent relationships and leads to problem in relationships. Or you're likely to start depending on external substances such as alcohol, drugs, and other things to create a pseudo state of happiness. But if you can't create that on your own, then you now have a codependency on something external to yourself, which again, pulls you out of your center. Your drugs and alcohol and whatever is out of the circle because you can't do your happiness or keep yourself in balance without some kind of crutch out here. So we, this doesn't mean that those types of things are bad. My approach to anything like, you know, marijuana, mushrooms, um, sex, parties, if it is genuinely giving you the nurture and the support that you need to do your work of life and spiritual growth productively, and you are genuinely growing, then that's the positive use of most anything. But if your use of those is addictive and you don't feel that you can navigate the world without them, or you're not able to go two or three days or a week without them, then it means that you're constantly being pulled toward something external to the self. And that, again, is a codependency. So it means that yourself is really sitting out here 
and that's very dangerous. And typically what you'll find with people that are in that situation is that, that they don't know themselves. They don't know what their authentic needs are. So they're kind of like leaves blowing in the wind and they're having to medicate themselves of the stress of having no clear sense of direction in their life, which is always very, very dangerous, especially if you're a parent. I found research showing that the number one common denominator identified in research looking at children with eating disorders and addictions and self-harming um, was parents that did not have a sense of direction in their life. So when children sense that mom and dad are confused and don't know where their paychecks coming from, if they can make the rent and they're fighting all the time, then the children innately, instinctually get very, very scared. Um, a good analogy is if you're sitting in the back of a car with someone and the driver starts a fight with their girlfriend or their husband while they're driving, naturally you're very scared someone's going to crash. Well, the car is a metaphor for life. If you aren't focused on the road and getting to your destination, your dream or accomplishing your goals, and people are fighting, then the children are scared that mom and dad are going to crash, and that means they don't have any safety and security, which is you know, a death threat for the psychological development and the health and well-being of a child. And since most people wearing adult bodies still behave as children and act as children, then you need to make sure you're clear about what your dream is, how you're creating balance with these four doctors, and that you're making effective choices or you'll constantly be living out of your center. And if you're doing that too much, it's a symbol that you don't really know who you are yet, and you may not have developed your ego, which means that you're still in the child archetype. Dr. Happy is the chief, not only of knowing what's happy making and scheduling it on a daily or weekly or monthly basis to make sure that it happens, so you take responsibility for your happiness, but Dr. Happiness is the overarching physician that establishes clear core values for happy making, for movement, doctor movement, for diet, doctor diet, and for rest and introspection, doctor quiet. So doctor movement really is in charge of saying, how much movement do I need? And what type of movement do I need on a daily, weekly, monthly basis in order to keep myself at baseline levels of health or have the fitness and strength necessary to fulfill the obligation of my stated dream, goal, or objective, be that athletic, work, etc. Okay, so how much movement do I need? What quality do I need? And how often do I need to do it to really be healthy first and foremost physiologically and secondly to meet the demands of my dream. Okay, Dr. Diet means what's the quality of my food and what do I need to eat to keep myself in balance. And that doesn't mean reading diet books written by people that try to sell you on what worked for them. That's extremely dangerous. There's about five or 6,000 diet books out there and it seems the more diet books we have, the fatter and the sicker we get. Why? because diet books are records of what worked for the person that wrote it, but we're as different on the inside as we are on the outside. So doing the ketogenic diet just because it worked for somebody else means you're avoiding the responsibility of engaging a relationship with your body. And if you're not engaging a relationship with your body, you're sure as hell aren't going to be living a centered life because you're always going to have body challenges that distract you from the necessary process of creating your dream and achieving your goals and objectives. So what is the quality of food that I need and what is it that my body is telling me it needs from meal to meal, which can simply broken down into how much animal flesh or animal-based foods do I need, fat and protein relative to carbohydrates or plant foods. So animal foods versus plant foods. Pay attention to how your body responds. Be honest with yourself. And as you learn to listen, and in my Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 2 training program, and even my HLC, Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 1 online, which is designed for the public, I teach you all sorts of ways to engage yourself so that you can learn what the optimal ratio is from meal to meal. So we have to have values around food and values around eating in ways that nourish us and support us so we can be healthy, balanced, centered, dream-focused, and goal-oriented, and know 
how to enjoy ourselves when we need to enjoy ourselves so we don't forget how to be happy. And if you're a parent, that's extremely important because if you don't teach your kids how to create happiness, then they're going to learn how to live the way you do. And I don't think you need to be a genius to figure that someone doesn't know how to create happiness is creating something else and it's not happiness. Dr. Movement, Dr. Diet, then Dr. Quiet. Dr. Quiet is the physician of rest, introspection, and regeneration. So how much sleep do I need? If you are an average human being, you need eight hours of sleep a night unless proven otherwise. There are various experts that say you don't need that much sleep, but most of them are tired, wired, and burnt out and just trying to sell you a bunch of silly stuff. And many of them have been my patients over the years. So if you can get by on less than seven hours or less than eight hours of sleep and have a clear mind and not have a body that's aching because it hasn't had time to repair itself and not feel like you're tired all the time and not have to keep drinking coffee and tea all the time just so you can function, then you've got the right amount of sleep. In my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, I go into many of the key things about sleep that people need to know but don't know what sleep hygiene is, how to set your room up for sleep, look at things like electronics, lighting, sound, diet factors that need to be considered, and, and much more. There's an entire chapter on that in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. And then we have introspection, which I will talk about in a minute, but introspection means to look back on your day and to look within yourself and be honest about what you're creating in relationships with self, other, or self and other persons, places, and things, because the places that we visit have an influence on um, how we engage ourself, who we identify ourselves with or as, and the kinds of energies that we're allowing into us. Hanging out in a bar with loud music and strippers and drunk people all around is not a good place to do productive work. It's a good place to medicate yourself because you're living a life that you don't really enjoy and need to have a reality shift just to sustain yourself so you can keep living somebody else's life instead of your own or doing what you're told to by some dictator instead of following your heart and doing what you want to do. So Dr. Quiet then is, how much sleep do I need? How much rest do I need, i.e. rest between workouts, rest between major projects? How many vacations do I need a year? How long are they going to be? And it means being aware of what you genuinely need for rest to be at your best in the creation of your dreams and the accomplishment of your goals and objectives. So you will identify those four doctors and the values, which are simple statements. I choose to only eat organic food whenever possible. I choose to exercise an hour a day doing the following types of exercise based on how I feel. Um, I choose to eat certified organic food and listen to my body and I don't drink uh, pasteurized dead stuff or eat processed garbage. With, you know, I'm just giving you examples of goals. I get to bed by, I sleep an average of this many hours a night, I take this many vacations, you know. So in your, these are your statements to yourself. As I've often said, your yes has no value until you learn to say no. And without core values, you don't know when to say yes or no. So you just end up eating junk, being in conversations with people that are distracting you, um, exercising or not exercising, and, and ultimately, um, living in ways that are just stopping you from being a productive person and getting pulled out of your center. You know, some of the things that we need to keep in mind along with these things, because they're essential to living a centered life and the practice of it, nobody's born and just falls into a centered life. Even if your parents were Buddhas, you would still have to learn to recenter yourself because you're inevitably going to have bullies in your life and Fauci's in your life and Bill Gates is in your life and whoever else that's, you know, stirring the pot, all of which is actually, from a spiritual perspective, a necessary growth stimulus because everything was just hunky-dory all the time. We'd all sit around smoking pot, drinking margaritas and doing nothing and not growing and evolution would come to a halt. So even though I don't 
condone the activities of some of the people I just mentioned, I know from a spiritual perspective what they really are and why they're important to humanity. And it's because I understand that that I'm able to keep myself centered to the best of my ability so that I don't lose so much time and energy getting caught in the follies that I can't manage the things that I have personally chosen, such as my dream goals and objectives, as important to me and my dream team and what I want to bring into my life and into the world. So a few things that we can look at that are really important for living a centered life on a day-to-day -day basis and a moment-to-moment -moment basis is what are the things that are happening or the events in my life that I can change versus the one I can't change. I don't know who the author of the quote is, but somebody wise once said, Dear God, give me the strength to change what I can change and the wisdom to recognize what I can't change. You know, obviously there's things going on in the world at any given moment, such as wars and Russia and the Ukraine and things like that, that most of us can't really effectively change by ourselves. And if we tried to, we'd have to let go of our responsibilities to ourselves and our family. And then we would just create another battle, trying to solve another battle. So there are people that are oriented toward that kind of thing. But the real question is, what is it that I can change? How important is it to change it? Because it's obstructing my ability to be the person I've chosen to be and manifest the thing I've chosen to manifest in my life. Or is it something that needs to be handled by lawmakers, um, politicians, uh, officials of some kind whose job it is to change those things? And if they're not doing their job, then what is it that I can do from a petition to writing letters to uh, going to rallies to help create public awareness? And how can I do those things within the context of the time that I have for those types of activities without disabling my ability to be a whole person and to keep my dream team healthy, be that your family, your friends, or your coworkers. So what can I change versus what I can't? We also have to be aware of what is true versus untrue. One of the things that commonly pulls people out of their center is when they get criticized or when their viewpoints are challenged, and that can easily trigger your shadow and trigger your unresolved wounds, which is why we have these opportunities so we can recognize where we need to do some healing work. As Jung says, you can't get triggered if you've healed the wound that was related to it. You just have empathy for the people that are being criticismal or rude or disruptive and you just have to learn how to manage those relationships so that it doesn't keep being a problem. Usually when somebody criticizes us, we know if it's true or untrue um, within it, within ourselves. So, you know, if someone tells you they don't, they don't like the way you look or they don't like what you believe in, give them permission to have that belief. It belongs to them. It doesn't need to be yours. Don't let people pull you out of your center. Also remember, misery loves company. So most of the people that are challenging us and trying to knock us out of our center are people that aren't living from their center and are miserable and are in the habit of disrupting people's lives because that's how they medicate and distract themselves from getting involved in their own and being an adult. It's just how the world works. Okay, so if we're dealing with something that we think is untrue and we know the truth, then we don't have to put much effort into it because we already know the truth and we can just leave them to figure it out on themsel for themselves and make their own journey. We don't have to you know, force them into our opinion or whatever. You know, lots of people, for example, in my career told me that all the stuff about gluten intolerance was a bunch of BS and blah, blah, blah. But here they are sitting with me paying a lot of money because they're in a lot of pain and they've read a bunch of articles that weren't true. So I would simply tell them that's actually not true. And instead of reading articles about it, why don't you simply take the gluten out of your diet and let your body tell you the truth. And so far I've never been wrong. Why? I know it's true. So as a therapist, I'm not worried about what their opinion is. You know, anybody that has a hard uh, 
belief system such as veganism, vegetarianism or religious dogma or diet dogma, be it ketogenic or any of these other things, um, the truth is you either wear it or you don't have it. Um, there's a saying, never judge a woman or a man by the creed he or she professes, but by the life they lead. In other words, you know, don't go to sick doctors for health advice. Don't go to unfit uh, trainers for fitness advice. Um, judge or evaluate whether or not somebody is authentic based on tangible results, not how many letters they have behind their name. That's the most dangerous uh, trap there is from that perspective. When you're feeling like you're losing your center, breathe and anchor. Just drop down, ex breathe through your belly, bottom, first two thirds from the belly or the bottom hand, hand on belly, last third through the chest. As you inhale, just visualize yourself growing toward the sun. As you exhale, sink roots into the earth and become more anchored. Usually 10 or 12 of those breaths, which I call centering breaths, can calm and center you. And remember, don't sweat the small stuff. If it's not being productive, then call a timeout and reconvene when you can stay connected to the heart or just disengage from uh, those kinds of relationships altogether if it seems to be a recurring theme with a given person. Next, take time for self-reflection daily. I like to do my self-reflection at night when I get in bed. I lay there and go into meditation. I review my whole day. I look at any challenges I've had with people, with schedule, with interruptions, with myself. And I simply look at like a movie unfolding in me and I look at myself objectively as possible. And you have to be very brave because if you do your review, but you're overly invested in your own opinion, you could be blinding yourself to an important viewpoint from another person. So when you're doing your self review, ask yourself, is it true? Is it really true? And if you're hanging on to your viewpoint without being honest about the validity of someone else's viewpoint, just look into your crystal ball and say, what's going to happen if I keep living that way, not listening to other people, not considering other viewpoints, which means not gathering information to make an effective decision, which requires that you have awareness of both sides of any argument. And so you just set yourself up for trouble. Okay. So at the end of the day, do self-reflection. This is also part of a process in the science of change called priming the pump. So let's say you have a tendency to get irritated by your mother. If you know you're going to see your mother again in a day or two, you look at what happened and you say, you know, I could do a better job just letting my mother have her own opinion, have her autonomy, and not feel like I have to buy into her viewpoint or argue with her or tell her that she's wrong, but I could just be at peace with letting my mother have the responsibility for her own choices as an adult and loving her because she's my mother, but knowing that what makes us all unique is that we see the world and experience the world differently. We all have our own set of values, whether they're conscious or unconscious, instead of constantly engaging in battle. So in your self-reflection, you're looking at this example of your argument with your mother. And so what you do to prime the pump is you say, okay, next time I get together with my mom and she starts telling me that I'm lazy or that I should have a different job or that I shouldn't be a musician because I'll never make money or an artist, that I should get a more respectable job or whatever, you know, how moms and dads, you know, the old saying, why is it that mom and dad can push, push your buttons so easily? Because they installed them. <laughs> so they're, they're actually their own buttons and they know how to get them. So the act of reflection and priming says, okay, when mom starts going at me about this, I'm going to breathe through my belly, center myself, and I'm going to take the higher road and give my mother position or whoever else it is to be exactly who they are without trying to prove to them that I'm right or any of that kind of stuff, because all that stuff pulls you out of your center. Okay. 
So once we're primed for change, we've got to, before we meet our mother, we've got to re remind ourselves, okay, here comes mom. I know how she typically pushes my button. So today I'm going to be aware when she says such and such or anything that irritates me, I am going to put my reflection and my new choice of behavior into action. And I'm not going to let mom pull me out of my center and know that the further you get out of center, the more energy you're consuming through internal stress, internal dialogue, and you want to be careful to always ask the question, am I here to create solutions or am I going to create more drama? That's your choice. Solutions, best solutions come from your center. Drama pulls you out of your center. And as most of you know, there's a lot of people that love drama. Why? Because they've never found something more important than gossip and shadow games. So they live in the shadows and they live in gossip and they live in distractions. But they're not usually people that are productive and they're not usually people that are um, oriented toward learning and growth. And sometimes we have to cut ourselves off from those people before they get so far under our skin that we find ourselves emulating them, not realizing that now we've become a drama queen and we're disrupting our own ability to stay centered and that of everybody else around us. And then we want to represent ourselves. So you represent yourself in this analogy to your mother with a more open heart, a more expansive viewpoint, and you leave room inside yourself for your mother. So you let your mom come on inside instead of pushing her out. If you're pushing her out here, then what you're doing is you're turning her into an object and you're not asking yourself the question, what would love do now? Love is always inclusive. Even people you have to cut yourself off from in relationships, it doesn't mean you don't love that person as a person. You may see their heart. You may see the beauty of them, but realize that they've just got some um, psychological growth and development to do. And then you just have to decide, how can I love them in a way that allows me to stay in my center? And how often can I engage that person? And that's what I call figuring out how to love somebody at safe distance. Can I love them with phone calls? No, too challenging. Can I love them with email? No, too challenging. Then can I love them by just holding them in my prayers and send them positive intentions from my heart and inspire them with unconditional love through my meditations? And whether or not they know you're connected, you know you're connected. And that way we're not leaving anybody behind and we're using our, our conscious awareness and our love to send them non-local support for their own growth and development, which is still staying connected in a beautiful way. So the key thing is, once we've reviewed through our past, uh, our uh, previous evening review of the day, and we see where the challenge spots and the challenge people and the challenge relationships or the addictions, addictions or whatever it is that's pulling us out of our center, then we, we prime the pump and say, okay, tomorrow when so-and-so tries to get me to drink beer, I'm going to say, no, thank you, not today. That's not part of my dream or it doesn't help me accomplish the goals I'm trying to accomplish right now. And remember, when people start being abusive by trying to control you and tell you what you've got to do or you can't do or threatening you, well, then that's an abusive relationship. And um, people that stay in relationships with abusive people certainly don't live in their center, and they certainly aren't likely to be getting very much done in the world. And so we have to understand that if we can't be honest and we can't get the respect that we need from people to love and respect and support us because we have mission, we have vision and we have values, then they're the kind of people that we need to love at safe distance and not get involved with because they will pull us away from meeting the objectives that can only be met effectively and optimally from our center. And so once you are primed and ready, then go represent yourself to your mother or whoever it is 
with an open heart, an open mind, a clear sense of values. You know, listen, but don't waste time being, having them try to convince you of something that you know isn't um, necessarily within your value set or worthy of your time. Um, we all have to decide, you know, where the edges of ourself are. You know, no matter how much you convince me to eat um, processed food, I'm never going to do it anyhow because I know the truth of it. It's what I do for a living is study that stuff and help people. So the point I'm making is when you know for sure that you're living from your center and someone's got weird ideas like you've got to be a fructitarian or something like that, you know, the first question I say, and how's that working for you, right? When I look to see if it's true, never judge a man by the creed he or she professes, but by the life he or she leads. So if you avoid getting caught in superficial distinctions and dis uh, descriptions and ideas and intellectual um, impositions and say, what's the truth of this person based on tangibility? Remember the old saying, the proof's in the pudding. If they don't have the pudding, then there's no need to waste any more time going through this. Just simply say something like, well, I'm really glad you like eating fruit all day and that you feel better that way. And I hope that you are successful with it. And I also hope you're aware of when your body starts to change and needs something else or the same thing that's making you feel good today will make you sick at that point. So insofar as one leads a centered life, tensions disappear. <clears throat> These are some of my tips and practices that I use to stay centered so that I can continue to share as much of my love with the world as I can, accomplish my dreams, goals, and objectives, do my best to lead my children and be a good partner and a teacher and a guide and a friend and to be wise enough to choose friends that add value to my life, not more drama. And I hope that you all can put this to practice to the degree any of these components seem helpful to you because we're at a time in the world right now where we all need to really be centered, work together, create a tribe of people around us that shares our mission, vision, and values, and see if we can add more love and higher consciousness to the world and share viewpoints that help us each make better decisions about the issues in the world because we are a collective of individuals. And if you don't have clarity within yourself, then you're likely to become part of a group, a group of individuals that hasn't got clarity within themselves. And there's a lot of people walking around the world right now that made decisions in the last three years without clarity, who really wish they had clarity first. Ignorance is not bliss. And living out of your center takes a lot of time away from you, a lot of energy away from you, usually leads to problematic relationships. And as Socrates said, Jung said, James Hollis and many others have said, if we don't question ourselves honestly, um, we're not going to live a life true to our heart. So the way they say it is the unexamined life is not worth living. So to know where our center is, we have to examine ourselves and be clear on the things that put us in our center so that we know when we're deviating from the center because somebody that doesn't have this clear doesn't know where their center is and they're likely to be over here in arguments or end up moving from here into an entanglement out here and that is how a lot of heartbreak happens. That's how divorces happen. That's how jobs get lost. That's how dreams don't get fulfilled and um, that's how the pain teacher shows up in our life to teach us how to be an adult and have a deeper spiritual practice that allows us to live in love fully. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoy practicing living from your center.